Well, good morning, everybody. It's 8.30 on a Thursday after a long week of presentations, so we're going to try to have a little bit of fun this morning with uh, some educational information and, of course, some product pitchy stuff because I am a, a vendor today. I've spent the last day uh, being the co-chair of the uh, technical working group. Today, I'm going to give you a little bit more pitch about what my company is up to and what we see going on in the market. So with all good technical problems and technologies, you have to have plenty of three-letter acronyms to keep you busy for the day. So today's learning opportunities, also known as TLOs, are going to talk to you about things like the edge and the need for, yeah, I know, there's, there's a few. Uh, edge technologies, things like the, it's going to do it to us again today. I was doing that last night. Same like, uh, I should use my bed here. I'm going to talk to you like this today. Um, I, if there's not something wrong with my SD pre, SDC presentation like last year, it just wouldn't be fair. Um, so to, I'm going to give you kind of four highlights. Edge needs CSDs. So if you were here yesterday, you heard about a computational storage drive. So my company manufactures computational storage drives. And I'm going to talk to you about the different form factor availabilities for those. And my cohort in crime, Mr. Ellie, is going to go grab my samples that I left on the top of the uh, room signage because I was playing around out front. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a little bit about how we put our architecture together for this CSD. And it uses a PCSS, or a Programmable Computational Storage Service. Again, that's a four letter to go with our three letters because three wasn't enough for us. And I'll give you some examples of how we use them for, a for artificial intelligence and machine learning and show you some example workloads that we've already demonstrated for both customers and uh, technical events. And then I'll give you a little bit of Hadoop and database examples of what we're doing. So the idea here today is to talk about computational storage deployments and how we've deployed them, how they would work if you would like to deploy them yourselves, things like that. So it was brought up yesterday that we all have a lot of data and we all know that we need to do a lot with that data. And a lot of the times people don't want to hear me tell you why I think you need my technology because if I tell you why, you need, why I need my technology then I'm trying to sell you my Kool-Aid. So what I wanted to do is spend a few moments and let you listen to a few industry experts talk about some of the problems in the market with data and you can use their words for it, not mine. So here's a quick video for you. Going to be adequate anymore to support the emerging internet Oh, cool. I'm telling you, I'm going to have one of those days. <laughs> PowerPoint crashed. There we go. Internet of Things is approaching us faster and faster. Things like the fridge, the dishwasher, the coffee maker will all have their own internet connections and they will be able to gather data. 50 billion network devices. For 50 billion devices connecting, driving traffic. It's not the devices so much, it's the amount of data that is just growing exponentially. At a certain point, the pipe cannot support any more data. One of the, the problems that has played cloud applications is the latency required to get data back and forth to the cloud. It just functionally wouldn't work. Uh, there would not be enough bandwidth. The servers themselves would get overloaded. For me, Network more and more you really need to have a device that can process the information that's coming in real time. As these new use cases evolve, because car, the connected plane, you've got this need for speed and, and latency and locality of compute that's going to drive you to do some of these functions at the edge. When it comes to making important uh, real-time decisions, edge computing significantly reduces the latency. Instead of us adapting to computers have to learn their language, computers are becoming more and more intelligent in the sense that they adapt to us. It is estimated that 45% of created data will be handled at the edge. That means storage, processing, analytics, and decisioning. And that's going to drive a need for some new capabilities and new technologies. So hopefully that gives you a, an idea. It, that is definitely a spin of the, the conversation related to edge computing. And granted, there are a lot of different buzzwords we're using today. We've got micro edge, mini edge, near edge, far edge. 
And there's still the traditional data centers that still have to cope with some of these problems around data. So realistically, that, that definitely spend a little bit of focus here from an edge perspective because it does provide a perfect platform for technologies like computational storage to be a value add to the ecosystem. So one of the things that we want to make sure and highlight as we walk through the technology discussions and hopefully throughout the course of the day as the other vendors and, and other people present is this is not a technology that we're designing or developing to replace existing architectures, but to augment or to simplify in some cases the existing architectures. Because there's been a lot of debate about what this is trying to fix or replace. It's not, it's trying to look at it in a new way. And you can see here, this is an example from Gartner uh, talking about where they see all the different opportunities for data generation. And it basically means that we have so many opportunities to expand the way compute is used, the way storage is used at various different locations in very differing ways. The way these systems are being built, the way they're being deployed, the way people are using them is not just rack and rack upon data. So we went from big iron sands to I'm going to build a rack of white box whatever, dirt cheap. Now we have to start architecting boxes that are designed for hardened environments, for autonomous vehicles, connected planes, or just even the now POPs, points of presence, that type of stuff. And those architectures provide an opportunity for something like computational storage to come in at the beginning of those architectural developments so that they're not trying to retrofit, but they're able to actually start off that way. And then you can look at it as far as like the retrofit ideas for the larger data centers, if you will. So this is a, an example I tried to put together in the simplest way I could as a marketing guy trying to talk to technical people. Uh, with all the data being moved to the edge, this funnel represents the idea that I'm looking for the blue dots. And the blue dots are located somewhere, and I need to get them to the appropriate filter within my funnel. And as we move that data through the funnel, you'll see that I, I have actually lost data, but I've gotten the data I wanted, but it took time to get there. Some showed up sooner, some showed up later. But if I go back, you'll see there's actually seven down at the bottom and only six come out. That's actually a problem that exists for one of our customers today is they're losing visibility some of their data because it's getting filtered in the wrong spot or it's not getting to them fast enough to let the systems manage that. So, and I totally forgot my introduction pitch. Um, so as you've probably seen already, I've swapped slide templates a couple times today. Uh, I'm going to continue to do that throughout the day. So I've got two or three more transitions that will take place through the deck. I'm trying to keep you guys all awake and interested and paying attention. So if you can come up to me either at the break, because I don't want to take away from the next presenter, I have a table outside. I will happily uh, pay you 10 bucks from Amazon if you can tell me how many different PowerPoint templates I used. And they are posted online already. So you do have a cheat sheet if you need to go out and look at it. So when we look at where we can deploy these products, the concepts of computational storage, and specifically for us, these are all workloads where we have engaged customers today. But again, it's not just the data center. So I can talk to the hyperscales and the second tier hyperscales and third, third tier hyperscales all day long and get a lot of good business from those folks. But really, as we move down this, this infrastructure, the edge devices and the center infrastructure are really where we're starting to see more attention and more interest. Uh, as mentioned in the video, connected planes, autonomous cars, we've got business there today because they do see the value in this technology and what it can bring because their infrastructure has power limitations, it has processing limitations, it has architectural design limitations that can prevent it from being able to accomplish what it's really trying to do. So when you think about an autonomous car, they want to be able to use one of these guys, your M.2, because it's small and it offers an opportunity to have some capacity attached to it. But if I can put compute in something they're already buying and give them some extra processing horsepower for no extra millijoules of energy, why wouldn't you want to try using that technology and see if you can make it work? There's going to be workloads it doesn't work for, I guarantee you. So from that point of view, this is the different kind of ecosystems that we see as opportunities for what we classify as our technology known as in-situ processing. So processing within the device. And in that case, you can see several different workloads or, or even infrastructures that we've looked at today. TensorFlow's machine learning, I'll show you some examples of that a little bit later on. Uh, last year, we introduced the FACE algorithm and what we did with a, a co-project with Microsoft around image similarity search, which is an inferencing-like or even a search-like architecture. We've got databases that we've played with. We've got things that we throw in Docker containers that we drop in the drive. And you'll hear a little bit more about some other people's ideas on how the Linux subsystem inside a drive will be of value later today from one of our partners and co-sponsors of this event. 
content delivery is a great example of where we can see this, uh, these architectures work because we're putting, if you think about where the ecosystem is being built and you read through the industry about where we're doing edge deployments and who's really building the edge data centers, it has a lot more to do with the telcos and the content delivery guys because we're streaming everything. Disney Plus goes live in a month or a few, you know, just over a month. We've got Hulu, we've got Netflix. All those guys have infrastructures that are now existing further away from the data centers. They're not just buying Amazon anymore. They're putting it somewhere else where they need it. These types of architectures can help them. Uh, machine learning, as I mentioned, we've even talked about HPC as an opportunity to offload. We had a nice conversation last night, and HPC guy's like, I see a use case for this. It's a great opportunity to look at this technology moving forward. So my one big product pitch slide, if you will, is this guy right here. So I already showed you the M.2. That's eight terabytes. This guy can run up to about 16 terabytes. This is our new fun EDSFF. You may have seen the presentation yesterday that talked about the new form factors. Uh, and then we also have your standard two and a half inch drive. And I can make this guy fit up to 32 terabytes. And that's where we get into an interesting conversation is blast radius or ability to actually deal with the gravity of the data on this device. If I've stored 32 terabytes of data and I only really care about a couple hundred gigabytes, why do I want to pull all 32 terabytes back into host memory to do some work? Why not let the, the system that you already have that has the capability to do it, search through, sort, rearrange, do whatever else, not where leveling and garbage collection, but actual data management, data analytics, data transformation at the device level, it saves you the bandwidth problem that is always going to exist. No matter how many lanes we put on the front of it, no matter what form factor we put it in, no matter how much power we give it, we will always fill the lanes of traffic we create for data. And the data size is not shrinking, so that's why these things are of value. Um, the fun part is things like this, I think we started with one form factor, there's now like 12. So there is a lot of debate going on in the industry what to do with form factors around these technologies as much as it is what we can do inside of them. So our architecture today, we build a ASIC based computational storage processor that is built into our NVMe SSD controller. We looked at it from a perspective of that the, there is enough of a market adoption for products and technology today that Putting it in an ASIC format, saving the, the hops, giving you something that you can scale in the right form factors was very paramount, but we are delivering an off-the-shelf NVMe SSD, so we have to do all your traditional data management, where leveling garbage collection, flash characterization, because I don't care which flash vendor you give me because I'm not a flash guy. That's one benefit that my solution offers is I can work with any of the NAND vendors. We put it in the right form factors, and then we add our what you classify as our startup value add, which is this in-situ in processing stack. We took a look at it and said, we want to make this as flexible for our customers as possible. And there's absolutely opportunity where what we've done doesn't fit for all workloads. But for the workloads and for the customers we've talked to, this is what they would like to see come about. So we've got a full drive Linux running or an OS. So the application cores that we've installed in our ASIC or built into our ASIC, let us run an OS. Does it have to be Linux? No, I've talked to folks about FreeBSD. We had fun as an experiment in the lab. We actually got Windows running inside the drive. Why you do that, I don't know, but it works. Uh, we can offer the virtualization concepts by letting you drop containers in the solution. This, again, is a flexibility play. It gives you the opportunity to be more flexible or easier to deploy your solution. And then it's built off, in this case, an ARM quad core, as I mentioned, a partner of ours. And we've even got the ability to throw hardware acceleration in it. So this first solution gives you quite the opportunity to look at these devices as basically a Linux subsystem within your particular platform. As we go through the course of the day, you're going to hear various other ways that these particular solutions are being designed and built for the concept of computational storage. Hopefully what we have to offer and some of the examples I'm going to walk through in the next few minutes will give you an idea of what you can really do with it. So as we look at it from more of a realistic uh, implementation perspective, we've taken some of the resources from a CPU, we've stuck them in the design, and then we've built a solution stack around it to support you. And I'm, I'm gonna keep reiterating a couple of key points because I wanna make sure that they come across correctly for at least our type of implementation of computational storage. It's an off-the-shelf NVMe drive. It will do, look, act, and treat your data as any other NVMe solution will today. You have the opportunity to turn on the additional ARM processors within our product that then can offload different types of workloads. And I've got AI workloads, I've got training ML workloads that I'll walk through, show you a Hadoop example. But the other part of this is we have to pay very much attention to the ecosystem it's being plugged into. So for example, this form factor only gives me eight watts. So I can't blow that budget while turning on the compute. So we had to write the architecture and design the architecture correctly 
so that your data can come in and out as an NVMe drive, and I can still do processing, and I don't overpower the system. And this is where things like the connected plane, autonomous car, or net edge device platforms are really taking a hard look at this because I'm staying in that envelope. I've optimized the solution to give you the best of both worlds, and we've classified that as watts per terabyte because it's a high density, low power consuming compute offload. Throw that into a TCO model for the overall system and your overall system power comes down as well. And I have an example of that in the deck. So when we looked at it, we said, here's your traditional SSD. You've got a media controller, you've got some DRAM, and you've got some NAND. And there were some companies back in 2012, 2013 that took this off the shelf design and actually implemented a version of what we're now calling computational storage. The trick that they had a, that ran into as a problem, if you will, is that singular media controller has to do too much. They don't have enough processing power to do true compute offload and manage the device. So we said, well, if we're going to do this right, we're going to add into the solution a secondary application core dedicated to compute offload. And that's where these ARM quad cores come in. We load the OS. And then the next part of it is, well, if I want my customers to be able to use this, I can't add another interface. I can't create another path because it needs to be able to plug in and work and be able to be operating from that perspective. So we're able to take the application or a version of or a partial of depending on the level of complication and engagement with the customer and migrate the application to actually execute user code inside the device. So I'm not modifying the code, I'm taking an instance of it, dropping it in and doing it in parallel across multiple drives. That way you get this concept of parallel and distributed computing with very little effort. Today, the way that we're doing it, it is a custom library and a custom API. That's one reason why we joined up with SNEA and created this computational storage working group along with about 40 other companies because we realized that the way we're doing it is a little bit of kind of new and innovative, but I can't make everybody adopt just my way of doing it because there's other people in the room that are doing it differently as well. But we all agree if we make at least the discovery and the way to plug it in and see what it can do common, then it'll work better for everybody. And since I already had DRAM in the device, I can share that DRAM between managing the drive, where leveling garbage, collection, data placement, and data manipulation in the way of transformation or any of the workloads that I'm about to walk through. So with that, I wanted to get into a couple actual architectural designs because you got to do a little bit of a mix and match of product pitch and technology and then actual ex execution of it. So this pr first example is where we took the concept of using our on drive Linux, we loaded Keras APIs into it that now run a TensorFlow application known as MobileNet V2. Now this MobileNet application is an object identification or object uh, recognition application. The, Little video is a GIF file, so I didn't bomb poor Brooke and the SNEA team with a large file, so that's why it's a little jumpy from that perspective. But as you can see, this application is taking those particular objects, it's identifying them and telling you what they are, and giving you the four closest representations of it. Now the trick to understand is, I have not modified that application. That is simply the application executing real time in my device, where the USB camera is passing information through the CPU to my, my SSD, I'm running the code and I'm replying back to the host with the answer. This can be done at scale where we've done examples of where we plugged multiple cameras into a system. Each camera goes to an independent drive. They all run concurrently and the host is sitting idle. The host is simply doing data pass through. None of the actual execution of that mobile net v2 is being done on the host resources. So this is an example where you can use it. In this case, it could be surveillance or it could be some other form of useful machine learning type of workload from TensorFlow. So another example is when we get into the conversation around neural networks and weightless neural networks versus convolutional neural networks. Last year with our example with Microsoft, it was a convolutional neural network. Weightless neural networks are starting to gain traction, but some of the problems we're running into when you look at these, for example, this particular uh, academic study, it's this concept of federated learning or distributed learning. Google brought it up in 2017. There's been a lot of papers on it. They tried doing it using cell phones for purposes of image capture and stuff like that with the Android platform, but it needs to be able to be migrated into more realizable and useful technology as well. And so we took an effort and said, well, we need to look at it from a different point of view and do parallel and distributed training can be done in our drive. We can do training in our drive. Because it's a federated or transfer learning process, we're, we're taking advantage of technology that others have deployed and implemented and being able to make the world quote unquote better, faster, stronger 
again, you're not buying extra hardware. You're simply using a device that has this resource available. So I'm not adding to a system. I'm just using existing platforms with a new piece of technology that you'd buy anyway, because you need the storage, and making it do something a little different. So this is going to be a quick kind of tutorial, if you will, of a walkthrough of how federated learning works and why it's valuable to the industry from that perspective. So I've got two systems here. On the left side is your traditional machine learning training algorithm path. And on the right side is how you do it with our, our technology or a computational storage solution. So the first thing you always have to do, and this is always going to be the case, is you've got to put data in the drives. Data you're going to store in your, in this case, storing pictures, storing whatever you want. For example, the, the object tracking that was done in the GIF on the previous slide. So that we don't change. You need the storage to work. It has to be common storage, hence off-the-shelf NVMe. But then it starts to get interesting when you get into the next step. Because what we then do is we migrate a copy of the existing training model into each one of our compute resources on our drives. Now, each of these drives have independent data being stored on them. They're not identical copies. I'm not, it looks like I'm replicating the same image, but they're actually, it's storing massive amounts of data in parallel across different devices. So now each of these training models are going to start doing some work. And when you do the training inside the device, each of those products or each of those drives are doing real-time training while on the other side you're re-migrating all that data back into the host resources and you need the host to do that model training. So this is your traditional versus your opportunity to save a lot of bandwidth and host power and host resources. The trick that then becomes is as you start to evaluate and update that training model, you'll see that on the left-hand side, I've got a model that the host CPU has managed through all of that data. On the right side, I've got a slightly different variation of that model because each of the individual devices have done a sparse model update. They've transferred that sparse model up to the main uh, update and it's created an even stronger model because I've distributed it across so much more resources and I've done it on a more localized set of data. And since that data set is smaller than the model is being trained on, it's actually more efficient. The trick was to be able to get it back up to the host and re recombine it, if you will, into something in the way of a new or innovative workload. And that's kind of what's been going on with this particular focus. So then what you do next is on the left, you have to continually repeat these steps. Train the data, load a whole bunch of information, evaluate the data, create a new model. And you're doing that by migrating data back and forth, as I was showing with my fancy green arrows. On the right side, I've simply migrated that new model down, and I'm going to reiterate again, but I'm going to continue to be a level of model value to the customer or to the person using this workload because I'm creating a more distributed and useful example of this training. And it saves host resources to go off and do what it needs to do in a way of gathering new data to put into those devices, because you're constantly updating the storage with new information to create the need for an updated or new model. So it gives you the ability to walk through this path over and over again, where I'm always going to consume the data, but I don't always have to return the data. I can return the value of the data in the way of, this, in this case, a training model. So I'm doing useful work on the data. The data has never actually left my device, but yet the value of that data has been presented back. And that's really where this concept of computational storage starts to gain even more net value, if you will, to the market. So what does that look like in reality? So this is an example of a, a database that was run, and it is a somewhat small database, but the concept here is I want to get to the most efficient level possible. And this particular training algorithm shows that after only doing four iterations with the federated model, I've reached a 94% accuracy of the data. So you can see that it asymptotically gets up to 98% over a very long period of time in the existing model, but by doing it in a federated fashion, it only took four iterations within the device to get to the same level of model training that it took an entire ecosystem of GPUs and other things that we're using for machine learning. So these are, the, these are the values that we're bringing. I've saved power. I've left the host alone. I've stopped moving data, freed up the data pipe to ingest more data because I'm not moving data back out because you always end up with the two-way street problem. And yet I'm still providing what the customer really needs at the end of the day, which is the value of that data. And that's what comp our computational storage and what computational storage products are working to provide. So in real time, as an example, this particular video clip is showing that we're going to do a model training of that object. So as this person moves the object around, the camera is tr tracing, following, and learning what that object is from all the different angles. 
You can see up there the model update that there's been 18 model updates in the short period of time the video loop has been running because this particular box here at the top, this is the quad core in my device. This is not the host CPU. Those guys are the ones doing all the work off of the different drives doing those model updates. I don't have the host actually executing this code real time on that image file or that video stream. The devices themselves are executing those model updates for that particular device. And this, this can go on, we kept it short again to keep file size down, but you can see that the ability to run com real time compute algorithms with no modification to the code, this wizard machine learning algorithm was just copied into the multiple devices that are used to do these model training updates. So that's where the value of computational storage and what we're offering our customers provides. So AI and ML is great. It's awesome. We know there are big buzzwords and I'm going to continue to ride that wave as long as I can because it's fun and I'm a marketing guy with a little bit of techie. But there's also some real world big data stuff like Hadoop that are useful to talk about as well as some databases in different ways of looking at how you can manage these things. So you're going to hear a lot about different database implementations, different Hadoop implementations of this product. So I wanted to give you our spin on it for today. So this represents a Hadoop cluster that was built and down here kind of represents what we're trying to do with our data, which you see that we've basically taken a portion of the Hadoop workload, the, da the data management node, and we've migrated into multiple uh, NGD SSDs or CSDs. And up at the top, you can see the two flat lines that are called the 16 core host. That's, we've dedicated 16 cores of this Xeon processor in the baseline of this product and normalized that result. So no matter how many drives are in the system, this, this particular workload on this set of 12 drives, the performance is the same as it's doing this particular application, which is a sort application. So we're like, well, that's great. We can make it faster, but let's make it more efficient. So we turned off eight of those, or in this case, yeah, uh, 12 of those cores. Two, three quarters of the processing power. So if I turn those off, of course, with no computational storage drives turned on, it's gonna run slower and it's gonna consume more energy because it takes more time to complete the task. But then I start turning on the computational resources within just a couple of the drives, which manage part of the data. And as you can see, as we start turning on these drives, at two, four, six, right around nine drives, I am now processing this application on this data set at the exact same rate of speed as the host was doing with 12 additional host Xeon cores versus using the computational cores inside my drive. And again, my drive is consuming no additional power to provide that performance benefit, and I'm saving you power because the Xeon is not running as fast, or it's off doing other things. So over here, you can see that we, that we looked at it from a power perspective, because that's part of the TCO model. And you can see, again, as I start to turn on the drives, my crossover point on power savings is actually before I reach a performance benefit. But then as I get significantly more power consumption savings, I've also gained 40% in execution at just 12 drives. And I'd challenge anybody to tell me someone that does a Hadoop workload with only 12 drives. Now, will that asymptote off? Absolutely. It's not going to constantly be a forever better improvement. But the simple fact that at 12 drives or half a server, I can provide you execution 40% faster on a given workload, that provides value to this, what this technology and what our products do for our customers. And then if I look at how you may build one, and this is definitely a singular representation of how you may consume this particular technology, but I'm using SAS HDDs in this case, because that's dirt cheap, because that's what people want to do when they come to building these big data platforms. It takes uh, nine rack servers to get me to 864 terabytes of data storage, or three quarters of a petabyte. And it has a single Xeon processor in each box because I'm keeping it dirt cheap. I don't want to put a lot of effort into it. On this side, we take our eight terabyte M.2s and some fancy new platforms that support 36 of those. And in three single one U chassis, I can give you that same exact density. So now here's your, I can shrink it and make it better play. But what this shows up here is I've now added 432 capable processing cores to that subsystem. So I went from nine Xeons with a whole bunch of cores within the Xeon to 432 additional drive cores that can be used to manage data. Now TerraSort works great because again, data is consumed and I'm just simply looking through it. Word count is another great example. I'm counting information through the data. I'm not looking to move the data. I'm not even looking to transform the data. I'm simply looking for the value of the data. And that's really what comes into play for this particular example. 
So another way to look at it, we did a MongoDB example, and we took a different spin on this particular workload. So this is an example of a retail website that's running in Mongo, and you can see the data being generated by the different websites kind of scrolling through this simple little video clip. So from this perspective, I'm not necessarily looking at computational storage as an acceleration of an architecture, but an ability to scale the architecture. I, I turn those things off three, four times, I swear. So this is gonna probably slip on me again, but um, let's see if I can get it to stop. But the idea here is I can provide scale because as I add a storage device to increase the size of this particular website or a retail footprint that's using a MongoDB platform, I provide them the opportunity to not have to add more processing, simply more storage. And that's really what it comes down to value. So yeah, again, sorry folks for that. So scalable computational storage, the ability to drive what I classify as the new cloud, because we have a cloud, we have a fog, we have, somebody at one point called it mist to get closer to the edge. However you look at it, our data is moving all over the place. It's no longer in just one location. It's no longer in just one type of architecture. It's no longer in just one type of workload. And being able to provide this flexibility of workloads and deployment is very much a key for what we're doing from this perspective. And that's what this edge data growth is doing when it's challenging these platforms. If you look at some of these new servers, we have a partner of ours, Lenovo, that has built an edge server that it, they were running around at the event when they first launched it by pulling it out of their backpack. It can plug into a wall outlet, it's got what, 5G engines on it, and it pulls right out of their backpack. Well, they need storage in that server. How are they gonna get enough storage in that server? And there's compute in that server, but if it's just plugged into any Joe Blow Schmo outlet, it's not gonna be multi-core dual processor Xeons in there. It's a smaller, lower power, lower cost solution, but it still needs to provide value. So if we put our particular drives in with it, we give them some extra boost at no additional cost to the system because it's just storage. They have to have it anyway. And if you can give them a high density storage solution, that's even better. And then as I've tried to illustrate uh, this concept of in situ processing or our version of computational storage, it has a wide range of opportunities to engage with our customers. You can SSH right into our drive if you want to have that capability and treat each drive as a Linux microserver. You can just simply use the GUI we provide and recompile on ARM. That's the extent of some of the software changes required for some customers. Uh, our particular workload example that we did last year, I didn't want to reuse the same slide two years in a row, showed that we could save about 500 times the load effort for the algorithm that Microsoft was using for their AI workload because they're not loading all the images, they're not loading all the data into the host memory, and they're not loading memory, processing on it, flushing it, and reloading. They're simply getting the value of the data out of the storage devices at scale. So I'm running a little bit ahead of schedule because I talk way too fast when I get excited about my technology. So I've got a few minutes for some questions in the room. If people have any thoughts, I see some curiousness on some people's faces. So please feel free to ask a question. I can go back over anything or uh, I'll let you free for a few extra minutes. How does that communication scheme work between your onboard Linux and, and the host? So for our particular implementation of this, if I go back to my fancy little drawing here, we use, in this case, a tunnel over the NVMe bus. So we actually embed TCP packets within the NVMe transfers to move the compute resources over. So we, it, I've heard people say that TCP can be a little slow or a little odd as a choice, but it's a tried and true way that exists within Linux as a platform. Again, we're reusing things that are already known not trying to reinvent the wheel. So yes, thank you for the question. Yes, sir. So you talked on a previous slide about your 16 core system versus four cores. You talked about power on that. And what you used as a reference was you have to have the storage there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, did you compare that against storage that did not have the additional um, processing for the computational uh, services. So the question he was asking is, in this example here, uh, this particular case, we did compare both with our drives on and off, which would, be the which would be simple. I don't just turn my computational resources on. He asked, did we also do a comparison of using non-NGD or just traditional drives? We did do that as well. 
it was it shows a similar type of performance challenge, but I wanted to just we didn't put that particular data in this slide, but we have done that work. If you're interested in knowing more about that, I can certainly provide it. This was our drives on and our drives off for this particular representation for sure. Yes, sir. You talked about um, the architecture having a processor with hardware acceleration. For the examples that you showed, there was it largely just using the risk of the CPU, or did you, did you actually offload something to the hardware acceleration? So right now, as far as the, t the, the products we provided, we do have a hardware acceleration engine inside the CPUs. We have not actually had to turn it on yet. We're actually working right now with a customer to turn on that hardware acceleration to further advance some of the AI workloads that we're using. Because we, we do have workloads today that we've tested, the customer asked us to look at, that are not optimized yet. And so we actually slow the system down. I'll admit that we can be slower in some workloads. So there, we are in the process of turning that on, and there's a lot of opportunity because it's a very open-ended engine from a perspective of what we can do. But it's part of that ARM subsystem that we've embedded in, inside the drive. How are you balancing the power of the eight blocks between the RAM and the ARM? So the question, I, and I should have asked, repeated the last one, so I apologize. Uh, so the question is, how do we balance the power between the, the overall subsystem of this? So when you look at my particular solution as an NVMe off-the-shelf drive, I'm not quoting a million IOPS. So I'm not quoting three gigabyte writes. I'm not the fastest drive on the planet because I don't need to be. So we've challenged and taken an effort looking at it as a random read, heavy read-centric like device, which is these everybody's calling a read-intensive drive. There's, over, there's overhead in those devices if you build the rest of the ASIC correctly. So we did an ASIC from the ground up. We're on 14 nanometer process technology, which gives us a bunch of power savings. And then the workloads, we've optimized the writes that we're not conflicting over that particular 8-watt limit for the M.2. And then when you get into the EDSFF and U.2, they have a much larger envelope. So the most challenging one we have is definitely the M.2. And you'll see that in the raw performance numbers. But again, I can, as I've shown, raw ver performance versus compute, I don't have an issue with the, the speeds of the drive when you're using it in a computational example. Yes, sir. Sorry. You first. Your hand went first. You're showing a, a direct connection there between the man made and the race. Does that work? So, this is an oversimplified marketing diagram. <laughs> uh, no, so the, the trick here is the data comes in over the NVMe protocol, the transport, PCIe transport NVMe protocol. Once it's in the media controller, we're transforming that data to be stored in the NAND using the NAND. Uh, in this case, toggle mode or on fee type of architectures. This really should be touching that. So we do use the media controllers attached to the ARM processors to do that so that we can see the data structure. Because we have to know the data layout, we have to know which LBAs are where, that kind of stuff. So, but the trick is I'm not using anything in the way of a storage protocol, I'm simply creating a bus between the application core and the media cores to do that management, which is still significantly faster than using the NVMe uh, protocol overhead. Basically, yes. There, there's a couple of additional internal buses that reroute where the application cores talk to the media, but the trick is we did not put, in our case, we did not put the application processor in line blocking the NVMe so that we don't create a contention between writing data and managing data. Yes, sir. So, does your host API Scott support getting data from a different CSD? So the question came from my friend who loves peer-to-peer, -peer, asking if I support peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah, or a CMB. So the, this first version of the product is not designed for that particular workload. It is fairly new. Yes. Correct. Exactly. So. There are multiple ways to deploy this in, in an environment. Today, our view of it with our current solution is I'm gonna have a whole bunch of these in a system. I'm gonna push an exact copy of whatever I want to do to every single device that's in that particular workload environment. 
If the information I'm interested in is not located on one of those drives, I'm simply going to get nothing back from that drive because it's looked through it and has no value added. It comes back with a null or whatever you want to call it. Longer term, now that things like peer-to-peer, -peer, CMB, and some other new features are coming out within NVMe and the PCI architectures, we'll certainly be enabled in the next solution from that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. That's another one I did have. <laughs> um, so, good question. Is Ethernet a good place to put in, in, the, in line with the NVMe? So, we've had a lot of discussions with customers about that. We have no qualms with necessarily doing that. As of today, there's no immediate plans to do it on this solution. There's always the dongle or the uh, attach point from certain other vendors in the uh, networking space that can provide that solution for us. So, there's opportunity to do that, but it also creates a lot of challenges that a lot of people may or may not know about around drive management and things like that. So uh, for today's products, we're going to stick with an NVMe solution. So yes, sir, you are going to ask a question. Yeah, no, you, SW, sorry. Uh, so there was, there's some implied data structure in there where you're, going, you're processing video, which is sort of not necessarily blocks. How, that, what's the data structure that I'm not understanding there? Is, there? is there a file system in there? So you're talking and probably about this guy right here, right, for example? So this particular application is being used to capture and store information and then in the host memory version, a non-computational version, you're streaming that video into the application, it's doing the data manipulation, identifying the object and sending it out. And it's being shipped to a drive to be stored as the drive stores it. I'm copying that instance into our device, so all I'm doing is moving that ability that exact application that already knows that file structure, already knows that how that file system is working, it's attached to the device just a little closer. I'm not recreating that structure from that perspective. It can be file, it could be block, it's whatever that particular application and this API are expecting, there's a replication of it in the drive. So, so you're using the drive's file system or the host's file system, is that true? Like how, how does the, the Linux kernel on the drive that has a file system yeah. And then you have a host file system. Which, which file system is actually used to sort of create the structure of the image? It's based on the host file system. And you're able to pass the sort of LDAs that that file entails to the Right. Which, to, to our, our friend over here in the corner, who I didn't get his name, made the comment about my data path drawing being wrong. I am talking through the media controller that's understanding the media structure from my OnDrive OS. So it, it understands that because, again, if I were to turn it on or off, the host will still do the same work. I'm just moving an exact copy of it in there to allow that application to run closer. The data path for my internal controller is talking to the same engine that is in line of the data path from the host engine. So I don't have that overlap problem. So I may have drawn it incorrectly, but it, is, it functions correctly. In a, in a matter of sense, yes. There's a little bit a different spin because we're not using NVMe as, as, as such. We're using an internal bus, and that's some of the, the IP that I've, I've created, or we have created, if you will. So, yeah, it's on, a, it's on a separate internal bus through that process, yes. So it does create, creates a lot of questions. I'm happy to talk about them one-on-one, -on -one, potentially under NDA. <laughs> There's a very good reason they don't put the CTO in the room because he would give all those answers. <laughs> but yeah, so again, the architectural structure of it, this is a very simplified version of it. There are definitely ways we can show how the programming model works. This is more of a hardware look to it, if you will. We have talked a little bit in the past about the software and how the data actually flows within the device. But again, that tends to be a little bit more uh, low-level conversation. Sure. So, so typically then do your customers, does the host API bind directly to the block device, like the namespaces, or do customers put a file system on the host, on the block device, and does the host API talk through the file system? So, are we getting to, is that an area you want to that, that would be an area where I, I've chosen to be slightly dumb enough that I can't answer it or I can say I don't know. 
Yeah. Yeah. Every once in a while I get into that conversation with the team and they're like, you don't want to know that because you don't want to have to lie to people saying you don't know what it means. So. There, there is definitely some secret sauce there that I am not comfortable with sharing. I think the idea is there's a lot going on and there's definitely a lot of questions, but at the same time there's a lot of examples of where it's already working. I know, they're not hearing him. They don't work very well, so. They, yeah. so Steven, my friend in the Twig and also coworker in the uh, computational storage products department was discussing the concept of the file systems and how they work and aspects of what we need to do in the way of uh, work within the computational storage Twig to make this more understandable for our customers. So there are aspects he was asking about how the interaction between the API and the file systems work that I was admitting that I don't know the answers to. So. Uh, and that is definitely some of the secret sauce and some of the patented stuff that they've done inside the, the company itself. So, cool. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, we have multiple different models. We have a, a GUI-like model for simple simple in, in engagements that use the API, where you do a storage call to the R API, and it does the work of <coughs> migrating a ARM compiled version of your application, so that as a user. If you're doing it at the highest level, you have to recompile whatever application you want into an ARM instance so that we can migrate that into the ARM core. So if you're working on x86. Yes. So the host side will have to do the compile of the code into ARM to allow it to be migrated into the device. Beyond that, it's not changing the code or rewriting the code. It's simply recompiling for a different architecture. So, yes, sir. Um, with the ARM core versus trying to do the, the application are you saying that the ARM cores are more efficient, or just that the whole that it's more efficient because it sits closer and you got a better bandwidth? So, so the question came out: Is it is it using the ARM cores more efficient, or is it just because it's closer that it's creating a, a benefit to the customer? Is that a proper repeat? Okay. So, from from that perspective. The ARM cores we chose definitely have some trade-offs. We could go much more powerful cores. We could add more cores. We chose for this particular case a quote-unquote less efficient as far as processing core, but a more power efficient core because we didn't want to engage that, that power offset. That's why I said earlier in the presentation, there are absolutely workloads where I slow things down today. Because it's closer, because I'm not requiring a storage call of actual media out of the device, at the size of our devices they are today and the speeds that we have within the flash, the, the cores we've chosen are efficient enough for 90% of what we've seen today in the market. So the idea is if I have to pull media from here over NVMe more than two times to fill a host memory buffer so the host can process on it, I can probably provide you some sort of either acceleration or equal performance at lower power. Because the more you have to pull data out and put it into host memory, flush it and repeat and keep doing that iteration, the more efficient this subsystem becomes. Our goal is to limit the IOs coming out while you're allowing continued IOs to go in. And that's really where our focus is. So it's a storage centric computational storage solution. Uh, as you can see in the, uh, the server complex over there, we still show a GPU. Real time data coming in, say for example, front end LiDAR and cameras from an autonomous car, you're probably not gonna use my solution for that. You'll have some other form of high performance NVIDIA or something doing that because that's True, inline, real time, I can't hit something. But all of the rest of the surrounding data and all the other information that that car has from an ecosystem perspective can easily be processed by this particular solution. Yes? So, so today, the, the drive presents itself as a block device. Do you see for the application the use cases going forward um, that it, it's more beneficial perhaps So the question is, today it's a block storage NVMe device. Do we see value in potentially having it be file or object oriented type of a solution? So for today, the size of the company, the efforts we put forward, it's going to stay as an NVMe device. As the ecosystem evolves and the needs for products in that space continue to evolve, we'll certainly look at adding those other variants of the product to our portfolio. But right now it's strictly an NVMe block storage device. 
All right. If there aren't any other questions, we're at the actual end time, so I'm glad I left some time for some questions from you guys. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and appreciate it. <laughs>